Now moving to the second presentation, which will be given by uh, Dr. Bela Desai. Uh, so Bela, uh, let me just introduce uh, her to you uh, uh, shortly. Uh, so Bela is a grants, uh, grants manager at India Alliance. Just a moment. I'm sorry, so sorry, uh, just a moment. Something seems to be. So, uh, Bela is a grants manager at India Alliance, and uh, she has done her master's from uh, the MS University in Baroda and her PhD from TIFR in Mumbai. She has done her postdoctoral training at the Scripps Research Institute in California. And uh, during her research career, Dr. Desai has worked on different uh, topics like motor neurons. Just a second, change presenter. Uh, on uh, different topics such as motor neurons, cytoskeleton, um, spermatogenesis, sensory neurobiology, and mechanobiology. She has published papers in science, nature, neuroscience, and molecular biology of the cell. At India Alliance, uh, she has been involved in grant administration where she is in charge of the senior and intermediate fellowship competition, both the pre-award and post-award uh, part. Dr. Desai has conducted several science communication workshops across the country. So uh, today now uh, we invite her uh, to uh, talk about the funding opportunities that are available at India Alliance and introduce India Alliance in general. Over to you, Bella. Thank you. Thank you, Himashri, for the wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I will now share my screen. Mm. Thank you. I hope that my screen is visible. Bila, it's visible. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Himashri, for the introduction. I will give a brief uh, introduction about India Alliance and also tell you about the funding schemes that are available. So um, I have about half an hour, right? Okay. So, okay. uh, India Alliance is an independent uh, charity that is funded by the Wellcome Trust UK and the Department of Biotechnology Government of India. Uh, we invest in transformative ideas and supportive research ecosystems to advance discovery and innovation in, to improve health and well-being of both humans and animals. India Alliance was started in uh, 2008 with our first fellowship being given out in 2009. Um, later on, as India Alliance expanded and evolved, we realized the importance of clinical and public health research and we realized the lacuna that uh, uh, Lacuna in funding that was there in clinical and public health research in India, and we expanded into those areas as well. When it was started, the idea was to implement a globally recognized fund, grants funding model, which was that of the Wellcome Trust UK. By creating a network of outstanding biomedical scientists all across India, the idea was to develop a Pan India platform for these outstanding scientists to interact with each other and thereby to facilitate the improvement not only of the entire ecosystem and not just the scientists who are being funded. Um, we also, the, an, another major goal of India Alliance was to reverse the brain drain. There were uh, to bring back scientists who had gone abroad to do their research by ensuring them that sufficient funds and facilities will be given to them to pursue their research. In pursuit of this goal, over the last 10 years, India Alliance funding has expanded to 508 awards across 145 organizations and 47 cities, all the way from Srinagar in the north to Tiruvananthapuram in the south, from Ahmedabad to Aizawal. 
um, this diversity is also reflected in the kind of uh, in the kind of subject areas that we fund. India Alliance does not have any particular mandate or um, particular uh, research area which is funded. As a result, we have a diverse um, amount of research areas that are supported by India Alliance. The as you can see from this uh, pie chart. The most heavily funded area is molecular biology, closely followed by clinical research and epidemiology. But you may notice that in addition to common, common um, areas, we also fund niche areas like uh, ophthalmology, dermaf demography, and, and anthropology. Um, in, in keeping with the theme of the talk, which is uh, next generation sequencing, we also, uh, I thought I would mention over here a few fellows that are involved in next generation sequencing. Um, Aruna Abha Chakravarti, Nishad Matange, Aruna Abha Chakravarti is at Tata Medical Center, Nishad is at ICEL Pune, Bursha Atik at IIT Kanpur, Shashank Tripathi, again at IISC, and Ashwin Sai Seshasai, who is at National Center for Biological Sciences. We measure the impact of funding, not only in terms of the diversity of the funds, not only in terms of the various institutes, various cities where our funding goes out to, we measure it also in terms of the number of publications. So far, 1,452 publications have come out of India Alliance funding, out of which 1,175 are open access. We also work not only in publications, but also in policy. We have 14 fellows who work on um, creating policies for the government of India, out of which seven have actually been implemented by the government. Uh, we are very proud of the diverse areas that are covered under these policy um, matters, which include things like tobacco use, tribal health, and nutritional guidelines. Um, science uh, communication is also one of our major focus areas. We reach out to not just scientists, but also students and researchers. About 9,000 PhD students have been trained by India Alliance Fellows, and in an additional 6,000 attendees have been trained through our science communication workshops. These are one day or two day events uh, to, in which the India Alliance team uh, goes out to different institutes. Now, of course, goes out to different institutes. This was in the pre COVID era. Nowadays, we have these uh, workshops which are conducted online. As a part of this science communication workshop, we have talks on grant writing, manuscript writing, research ethics, and how to give uh, presentations. Please do write to us if you would like to have such a science communication workshop conducted at your institute. Uh, in keeping with the mandate of India Alliance to promote clinical and public health research, uh, it the need was recognized that um, even clinicians and public health researchers need a science communication workshop of their own, which is why the DIPS workshop was started, in which more than 200 physicians have been trained in the same aspects. Uh, at a much higher level, the India Alliance EMBO partnership operates to train um, scientists in leadership and lab management. 500 such scientists have been trained in that uh, program. And not just scientists, physicians, and student researchers, India Alliance also reaches out to the lay public through popular science talks, uh, through promoting the interface of science and art, through health awareness programs. Uh, a total of 63 such programs have been conducted, uh, covering 15,000 lay people. Uh, I'll now talk a little bit about the fellowship uh, program features. Um, as the name implies, the India Alliance fellowships 
emphasis is on the fellows. We emphasize on the lead investigator with no restrictions on age, nationality, and due regard is given to non-research career breaks, particularly maternity breaks. And this would be important for female uh, attendees. Uh, we do not have a requirement for any salaried position or commitment towards a position. And our entire process is completely online. We encourage our applicants and uh, to pursue interdisciplinary research. While our main focus is biomedical research, we encourage applications which from uh, mathematicians, physicists, engineers who can talk about a, a biomedical angle to their research project. We um, also encourage international collaborations. International collaborators may be added to the application in the form of collaborators, external sponsors, um, etc. And this is a feature that we are particularly proud of, which uh, I'm sure no other funding agency in India provides, which is flexible funding. Uh, whatever um, proposal or budget you put forth in the application, you are not bound by that budget. During the course, if you are awarded and during the course of your research program, if you find that you would like to change the kind of funding or you would like to spend on something else um, on a different head, you would like, for example, you would like to move the funds for support staff towards materials and consumables, then this is allowed. Uh, the India Alliance fellowships come under uh, three levels. The early career fellowship is for researchers who are just starting out on their research career, um, usually just after your PhD is finished. The intermediate fellowships are for fellows who wish to establish a research program or um, to start a lab. And the senior fellowships are for researchers who already have an established program and wish to expand on that further. All of these fellowships are at uh, you may notice there are at three different levels, but at the same time, they come in two flavors. One is for basic biomedical research, um, and the other is a clinical and public health component. Uh, this is an overview of the three schemes at three different levels for the basic biomedical um, flavor. We have uh, the eligibility for early careers is from uh, minus one to four years of post PhD research experience. And by minus one, we mean that you can be in the last year of PhD when yeah. you apply. For the intermediate and senior, we have a blanket eligibility, which can be from four to 15 years of post PhD research experience. All of our fellowships are for a duration of five years. Uh, the budgets are different. For early careers, it is 1.7 crores. For intermediate, it is 3.6 crores. And for senior, it is 4.5 crores. Uh, they also differ on different aspects in terms of equipment, support staff, uh, travel allowance. Uh, all of this is on the website. I would encourage you to go there and uh, look it up. But for now, I'll just talk a little bit about the work outside host institution component, which is a feature that is unique to the India Alliance Fellowship. Um, under this feature, when you apply for an early career fellowship, you can propose to spend up to two years outside India at the lab uh, of your choice. This can be for up to two years. And India Alliance, in addition to providing the travel costs, will also provide an additional stipend over and above your personal support of $3,000 per month. For the intermediate, this is up to one year. Uh, of course, it you cannot just propose to, to go to any other, any random lab. The lab that you propose should be um, some should tie in with your research and you should give a very proper justification for why this lab is going to this lab is important for your overall proposed research project. Um, similarly, uh, these are our clinical and public health schemes. There's, there are two differences in this scheme compared to the earlier one. One is the eligibility. Over here, a PhD is not required. You can have up to minus one to 15 years of post uh, higher medical degree experience. This medical degree can be an MD, MS, uh, Master in Public Health, or any equivalent degree that is recognized by ICMR. 
a budget cap in this case is slightly higher in order to make allowance for the non-practicing allowance that is given to uh, clinicians. Um, that was the call about our uh, fellowships. I'll talk now about our grants. Grants for India Alliance is a relatively new thing which was started a couple of years ago. We, it comes under three categories, which is a team science grants, clinical public health research centers, and clinical research training program. The team science grants is to foster interdisciplinary collaborative research to encourage scientists to not work in silos and to interact actively with each other. The clinical and public health researchers also build on this uh, goal. However, an additional component is provided of um, creating research centers that um, train physicians in doing research. Under the clinical re research training program, um, it is a subset of the clinic and public health research centers. And uh, what we mean is that this is embedded in the CRC scheme. This additionally provides fellowships for physicians to do research. I'll talk a little bit about the team science grants. A minimum of three principal investigators are required to apply to this grant. The, PA, the principal investigators should fulfill the eligibility criteria for India Alliance, and I spoke about this already before. In addition to that, they must have at least five years of experience in running an independent research group or lab. Uh, in all other cases, it remains uh, the criteria remains the same as before. We do not have an age or nationality bar. However, the lead PI must be based in India, but the other PIs can be based overseas. The funding level of this is much higher. This provides up to 10 crores of research funding, which includes 10% overheads. Um, similarly, the clinical and public health research centers um, is aimed towards uh, improving the clinical and public health research ecosystem in India. So this is more of a clinical and public health research focus. Uh, the clinical research training program, in addition to doing some kind of clinical and public health research, the physician scientists are required to provide uh, training to physicians. And for this, up to 12 fellowships can be uh, requested as a part of this program. And the value of each fellowship is up to 50 lakhs, which provides only for the personal support of the fellow. Um, this is uh, something that we get asked quite often, even after we speak about our fellowships and our uh, grant programs, is uh, what is it that makes an application strong? Now, um, of course, the first thing is motivation. You know, your passion, your dedication to research should come through in your proposal and in the way that you write. Scientific productivity is important. And uh, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is publications, patents. Uh, but at India Alliance, when we assess applications, um, publications are not the only thing we look at. It is one of the things. But in addition, we look for a commitment to doing science, a commitment to doing research, which includes presentations that you have made at any international conferences or uh, national conferences and any kind of mentorship that you have undergone now any kind of mentorship that you have given to other people so please make sure to mention all of these things in the application the third thing is uh, you must ask an innovative question it cannot be anything that is just run of the mill just like um, that it it's not enough to ask an innovative question. You must answer it in an innovative manner. You must propose something that is feasible. It must not be something that is completely uh, up in the air. Um, you must show that you have expertise in the idea uh, that you're proposing. And of course, it could be that uh, you are thinking out of the box. You may not have the expertise entirely to do a particular project, but it is OK if you demonstrate that you are aware that you do not have the expertise and you try to cover up this lacuna. And one way to cover up that lacuna is by uh, including collaborators that can provide you that expertise. 
we also look for good grantsmanship in the letter that is in the application that is done uh, the letters must be supportive uh, should speak about you as a candidate should speak about your scientific expertise and not just not other things uh, i've already spoken about this before that you must demonstrate your willingness to move out of comfort zone and of course you must justify all of your choices mm, these are the deadlines that are coming up our next early career fellowship uh, call will be in june 2022 uh, the senior and intermediate fellowships will be launched in february uh, i think it is february 1st uh, the next clinical and public health research fellowship will be launched in the middle of february and in case of grants, the next call will be in March. Uh, I would encourage you to visit our website and keep uh, a lookout on our social media. We do announce the launch of competitions on all our social media handles and also on our website. Um, so please do look at the website to understand the dates. In addition to that, we are also available. The grants team is available to answer your grants and fellowships related queries at info at indialliance.org. In case you have um, questions regarding workshops or you would like us to have a hold a workshop at your institute, please write to us at workshops at indialliance.org. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I will now take questions. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, regarding the team, you can always put it on the chat box and also you can uh, raise your hand if you want to be unmuted. I don't see any questions as of now. Sure, sure. Um, we, we I, I'll be here to the end of the talk. So till that time also, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer I either see over one, chat. One raised hand uh, from Shiv Shant Upadhyay. So I'm going to unmute. Yes, it's self muted. Uh, so do you have any question, uh, Shiv Shant? Yeah, am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My question is that is there any grants available for the students who have just passed out from their PG degrees? Yes, the only fellowship. You can apply to that. Okay, okay ma'am. And uh, look, is there any let's say, work going on in the institute uh, in let's say terms of molecular biology? I'm sorry, there's a bit of a disturbance. I didn't get your question. Okay, uh, ma'am, uh, my question was, look, is there any uh, work going on in the uh, same field of molecular biology? Yes, yes, we have several grants and fellowships given out in the field of uh, molecular biology. I think it is one of our most uh, popularly funded areas. Okay, as I saw, like there was uh, quite a bit of emphasis on clinical biology. That is why, uh, like, I was to ask this question. No, uh, a majority of our fellowships, I would say, um, about 50 60 percent are still still go out to research work that is of a fundamental nature. Uh, so, uh, ma'am, uh, like in case like if uh, we have received the fellowship, so we'll be allotted with the institute, uh, let's say, which is collaborating with the organization or it is a separate institute? No, when you put in the application, the institute should be mentioned on it. Uh, for the preliminary application, if there is no letter from of support from the institute, it is fine. But for the full application, we require a letter of support from the institute saying that they are willing to host you. Okay. Of... I'm studying in University of Mumbai. So let's say if University of Mumbai is supporting that, so it will be the institute where I'll be working for my fellowship. Correct, correct. But we do not require that you should have a position over there. That is not required. If the institute is willing to support you just with the fellowship, then that's fine. 
that is also okay. Uh, we have a few other hands raised. Uh, yes. yes. Ma'am, may I ask a few questions? Hello? Ma'am? Yeah, so uh, let's say, like, uh, as you told, like, yeah, there will be fellowship. So, is there any like duration or, or like uh, or time or month in which the fellowships are open for the applications? Yes, yeah. So, I, I, I'm guessing that you're interested in the early career fellowship. Yes, ma'am. I'm sure uh, there will be many questions and uh, uh, for you. So, uh, all the anybody who has questions uh, for Dr. Moore or even for um, uh, the earlier session we had uh, on funding opportunities, please feel free to uh, you know raise your hand and ask the question. Uh, so, I, and I would request those who are, whose questions are answered to unraise their hands so that we can identify the prop people who are uh, have the questions. So. Are there anybody who has uh, questions on this presentation? So in the meantime, I can start the the question that you shared with me yesterday. Like one question was uh, the future of the NGS. So I would say the future would be like. Um, like my own project is having the like um, uh, sample to sequencing type methods where we just add the sample and then get the final output so no no need to worry about all the inter, in, uh, intermediate steps so uh, i have one project going on and then uh, different labs are also working or like oxford nanopore also have the final goals to sequence anywhere by anyone uh, anytime so that's kind of the future where we not we may not be worried about the expertise in the library prep or the wet lab part, but the final interpretation will be critical. Um, or uh, like my project, it will be just the final output. So you just have to be expertise, just interpret that final data and make correlation for your uh, uh, research hypothesis. Um, so that's one second there was i think the question related to the fish uh, uh, in the in the fish research so i'm not sure about the, exactly what they are asking but in 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 my lab i have the the very big project on the studying the virome of the common carp so as um, opposite to india in here in the us or especially in the minnesota common carp is a big problem so we wanted to get rid of the common carp and the silver carp uh, because they are uh, uh, dangerous for the native species and the, the lakes also. So Minnesota is known for the, the state of the lakes. Uh, we have more than 10,000 lakes here. So we have the center that is working on the different methods for controlling the common carp. My own project is on finding the pathogen that we can use to kill the carp. Uh, which is on the car specific so like the the koi herpes virus is one that is specific to the common carp and carp edema virus is another one so but our objective was just to screen the virome and then use the virus that is already present in the population here without uh, instead of bringing virus from the outside um, so in that we are doing the virome analysis uh, but with the objective to kill the use that virus to kill the carp so kind of uh, opposite from my veterinary uh, ethics where we work uh, with the viruses or the pathogen to protect the animal species and the uh, human species um, and on the fish viruses i would say or the pathogen they are so divergent especially on the viruses side that only we can detect by next gen sequencing methods and a whole new chapter or the book can be written on the the novel viruses in the fish still a lot of uh, 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 viruses are still need to be discovered in the fish side and i think one question was on the bioinformatics side so as i mentioned the bioinformatics or the data analysis will be 
the key point in the future. So yeah, if you have expertise here in the US also, I would say that there is a huge demand for the bioinformatician. Uh, it's hard to keep the bioinformatician uh, for the universities because the companies are paying a lot to the bioinformaticians and uh, universities cannot pay, compete with the companies for the same salary. Uh, but there is a huge demand for the bioinformaticians. Um, if you have expertise and or if you wanted to make the career uh, in the data analysis, um, uh, I think the, there is a future. Great. Thank you for answering the questions uh, that were sent to you earlier. Uh, so we have three raised hands as of now. We have, uh, so I will just unmute them one by one to ask their questions. So we have Agha Sakip uh, Raja who wants to ask a question. Uh, uh, Mr. Agha, I have uh, unmuted you. You can go ahead yeah. with your question. Yeah, okay. Hello. Um, thank you, Sunil, sir. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. I have a few questions. Sure. Uh, may, uh, so, sir, I am a, a medical doctor actually. I currently work with cancer patients. So, okay. uh, how uh, good in terms of results the paraffin section is as compared to the fresh tissue? Oh. It's a good question. So, uh, I'm not familiar with the, the on the human side much, but from my own experience, um, it worked very well if the sample is um, the formal fixation time. If you are uh, already aware that the sample will go to the for the sequencing also, um, then I think we control on the formal fixation time and uh, mm. the method. I think then still we can use it on the formal. Nowadays, this all the library prep kits and they mm. just mentioned this point that okay it can work with the highly degraded uh, RNA or DNA so in uh, my own lab as I showed this one example of this uh, Mallard papilloma virus uh, yes. it was the sample was not processed as per the sequencing rule but um, we were able to assemble the whole genome so even with the unbiased or like in case of the cancer I think that these targeted panels are um, uh, very popular or the well-known uh, in case of the human side. So these are the targeted methods panels that uh, should work very well on the on the formalin fixed uh, paraffin blocks. Um, okay, sir. So it is comparable to the like the fresh tissue. Hello. Yeah, should be. Okay. Okay. okay but like we should consider like if there is a the the processing time sometimes that also the degradation or the what effect that has on the on the nucleotides yes. but it should be comparable in my opinion okay and uh, in in the ngs like we have to the companies are also interested we have to like think about uh, do some prior preliminary optimization work uh, with the particular okay. sample type and then do some side by side comparison and if you are confident okay we are getting the the equal or uh, kind of similar results then we can uh, apply the method on the continue to use that method okay okay uh, so one more question i have um, actually i am planning to do uh, uh, rna sequencing of urine uh, in bladder cancer patients to okay. discover novel biomarkers. Mm -hmm. So, um, in few articles I saw because uh, the urine has, I mean, in cancer patients, uh, red blood cells also, and a lot of WBCs also. So, in few uh, like articles and studies, I saw that they are depleting the WBCs and RBCs, uh, while in others they are not. So, what is the best approach? I mean can we do that if we do not deplete it and uh, can we do this at the analysis stage that okay whatever genes are related to wbc or rbc uh, we can exclude it because rbc is okay depleting uh, but wbc depletion it again becomes uh, it's antibody based it becomes a complex and expensive uh, procedure 
so what are your views on that i mean can we do that in analysis part that okay uh, yeah so in the analysis part we can take them out so so like in my lab also we focus on the 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 pathogen uh, like virome uh, viral wall genome sequence so my objective is to get rid of the host bacterial part as much as we can um, okay. so there are like different methods so we have to make balance like uh, about the time for sample cost okay. and the, the easily applicable method so you know, instead of going to the perfect if we are nearly perfect and then mm. just add the more reads if we are getting more background with the wbc uh, that mm. will be fine but on the bioinformatics level we can take them out in the yes. oxford nanopore i think it just started there are the the some software so when it starts sequencing it will sequence the only the target of your interest and uh, all others it will be just reversed out um that kind of method is also coming up for the oxford nanopore so that the pores will not be used for the junk part of the sequencing only the useful uh, or the related uh, target related part will be sequenced uh, that kind of the method will be uh, coming up in future where we can apply instead of bioinformatics analysis side right on the sequencing side also we can make selective sequencing also one last question i'll ask you uh, can you can you suggest any uh, short term course of like for sequencing to learn it more like in practical ways uh, i think in india there there are different courses i'm not familiar with the but different um, courses or companies but i heard about the the genotypics that they are they have access to different platforms and i think they conduct uh, uh, workshop at regular intervals also so but uh, maybe dr malik or others have more information uh, for the trainings in india uh, another aspect i told you this uh, uh, bill and melinda gates foundations uh, they have this um, grant funding on the uh, public health side uh, where they can give experience uh, training on the uh, next in sequence uh, library prep and the bioinformatics side also and they will provide support throughout the project also other than that i think uh, here in the us sometimes the people they approach to the particular lab or the pi uh, if they uh, depending on their interest on the sequencing side and if they allow um they can go and visit for them their lab for three months or six months um recently i have contacted uh, two three faculties from the veterinary universities i think the indian government is providing uh, some fellowship to the faculties to go abroad and uh, gain experience on the next gen sequencing or the advanced molecular biology uh, they will provide all the like, travel lodging all the expenses so if any pie or the, any uh, lab interested from abroad to provide uh, to host and they can work there for three months or six months and gain uh, experience in the particular field so i hope that answers the question uh, we have to few more hands up so we'll move to the next uh, speaker yes sir thank you so much Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to email me if you have any further query or questions. Um, um, sure, sir. Thank I you. I will be happy to help you. Sure. Uh, we'll now move to the uh, next uh, questioner, uh, Mr. Anuj Bandral. So you, I have unmuted you. You can ask your question. Thank you. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor, for such an enlightening talk. Because as a young uh, student of this biotechnology, I am a bit curious to know about this. That uh, how much time it will take for this uh, next gen sequencer to sequence a genome? Is it based on some complexity? If the sample is complex or something like that, that is, uh, or there is a fixed time that uh, in that time we can get the whole genome sequenced or something like that? Yeah, for that it will be like. We need to optimize the method uh, 
first like uh, depending on uh, our interest so if you are doing the plant genome it will take obviously longer time um, like in case of the long read sequencers um, either the pec bio or the permethion grid ions uh, versus the minion um, depending on the tools that you are using it will take time accordingly and take more time but if you are doing the bacterial whole genome sequence or virus uh, whole genome sequence so viruses are very small in genome size and then we also have to keep factor in mind like the the coverage so if you are adding the 30x coverage of the genome or 50x coverage of the genome so it means if we have one kb genome and if we wanted to add 50x coverage then there should be uh, uh, 50,000 reads for that particular uh, uh, our interest genome and if depending on how clean is your sample or uh, depending on the background noise so these are the methods like uh, you have to optimize first and once you optimize your condition by doing the one or two initial trial run you will get to know um, how much uh, running time you need uh, if you are doing in your own lab but if you are submitting samples to the sequencing companies then they can calculate it for you um, Okay, and sir, one last question, sir. Uh, is there any limitation of this next-gen sequencing uh, till now? Uh, you have because you are using this technology. Are you facing any limitations of this technology? That that's what I mentioned here. Like, um, although I'm in the diagnostic or research field, so I, I just touch more example on the diagnostic side. But um, the challenge, I would say, like the challenges are like. Um, uh, if you are doing like with the clinical samples um, and if you are looking for a let's say example of the viruses um, they are um, they have to compete with the in case of the non-targeted method they have to compete with the uh, host or the bacteria or non-related things um, so in case of the non-targeted it's like a unbiased amplification so whoever present in higher amount will be amplified more as compared to the, the lesser uh, representation. But in case of the targeted methods, I think um, this is the excellent tool to use for doing the whole genome sequencing or the sequencing of our target and do the comparison. So that's why for the SARS-CoV-2, we are doing the sequencing at such a large scale. Okay, so, so sir, it's mentioned in the last slide like it may not work with every type of the samples um, for the every type of methods, but uh, you have to be very careful like what is your objective, what you wanted to achieve, and uh, what sample type we have. Um, so, if we plan um, in very nicely, then I think we should be able to get good good data of our interest okay so sir is it okay to say that uh, now sanger sequencing is become redundant or something like that in light of this next gen sequencing uh, not now but i think in the coming future with these uh, targeted uh, methods um, they will cover up because they are very fast uh, the faster turnaround time uh, multiplexing but still if we compare the the sequencing cost i think the Sanger is still useful. I'm not sure in India, but here, like, we can get the Sanger sequence in six dollar versus, um, no, let's put in the other way. So if we do, depending on how you are comparing, uh, so if we compare the in the thirty-seven dollar here in our diagnostic lab, we are doing the SARS-CoV-2 whole genome sequence by targeted method, versus on the Sanger, you are doing the six dollar Sanger sequencing for hardly one KB product. So still, I think it will be in use, but in near future, I think the these targeted uh, methods, uh, they will take take the Sanger sequencing part. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for such enlightening talk. In Sanger, we have just forward reverse 2x coverage, but in the targeted methods, we can add 10x, 20x, 50x coverage, depending on our interest. So give that will give us more confidence if there are more variants are present they can be detected which we may miss in the Sanger sequence 
or just see the, like um, uh, fuzzy peaks, uh, not able to make clear distinction. Um, so those kind of challenges that Sanger has can be resolved with this targeted sequencing. Thank you so much for such information, sir. A huge round of applause for you. Thank you. So like in our BLV project, as I mentioned, in we processed 60 samples library prep in 30 minutes, they were on the sequencer. And then with two hours sequencing run, we were able to get such a high coverage with the uh, different types of the sample. So in kind of very fast and high throughput and generating a lot of uh, useful information as compared to the singer. Thank you, Dr. Ramon, for uh, you know for the answers that you have provided. We have another person, uh, Shivshant Upadhyay, uh, with his hands up and a whole, whole lot of questions in our question box. So no I can request all of the questioners to be you know quick uh, with the questions, uh, okay. so that we can give the opportunity uh, to everyone uh, to ask. So, uh, Mr. Shivshant, I have unmuted you. Uh, can you uh, speak now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So the question, the same question I'm going to ask, like which I have written in the chat box. So, sir, like uh, if you are comparing the sequences generated from the uh, next-gen sequencing, so uh, like what is the sensitivity level? Like what is the data? Like the sequence data? Is it uh, more sensitive than what we get from the Sanger sequencing? As like we have you know learned about that sangha sequencing is one of the best techniques available till date like it's the principal techniques so what is your review on that yeah if we uh, on the illumina side their their accuracy is 99.99 percent that they call and same we have seen our uh, in our uh, analysis also uh, on the oxford nanopore they claim now 98%, but depending on the sample type or the year run, uh, it may go up to 95 to 96% also or more. But uh, on the Sanger, if you are adding 2x coverage, here you are adding 100x coverage. And same on the Oxford Nanopore side, we may add more coverage. So doing this error correction um, the, during the bioinformatic analysis part, um, they, they are equal. Uh, sensitive in providing the quality data or the 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 quality reads uh, as compared to Sanger, even better than Sanger, I would say. Okay, okay. And sir, like uh, the other sequencing methods have been arrived in the market, like the second gen sequencing as well. So, like how that has been compared with the next gen sequencing? Like what errors it has resolved that it is the second gen sequencing? Like what advantages it adds? Um, could you please repeat your question? I'm not able to understand. Uh, sir, I was saying like uh, Sanger was there, then, then uh, comes the next gen sequencing, and now we have second gen sequencing as well. So, Third like, gen. what extra, yeah, what extra added advantages the new techniques bring in contrast with the next gen sequencing? So, in the Second generation sequencing, it's still like the, the short read, like the Sanger can go up to the 600 is the maximum one for the, uh, like the Illumina platform, uh, like one read size. Uh, uh, but it generates like a millions of millions of reads, uh, such a huge amount of data that um, even with the short reads, uh, we can assemble the, the whole genome, bacterial or the even the viral, uh, or uh, uh, by doing the multiple sequencing runs, we can even assemble the, the genomes of the large genome sites. Um, adding advantage on the second generation sequencing, the third generation sequencers came up with the, the idea of the long read sequencers. So they start like, they are not good for the small um, amplicon size, like 1 KB or 2 KB, but if they go from higher like 5 to 500 kb or even so in the pack bio or the oxford nanopore like the grid and permethians um, publications have mentioned that they in one sequencing run 
they were they were able to assemble the whole human genome or the plant genome so it's kind of the revolution that we cannot expect with the the sanger that's why with the sanger first human genome sequencing took almost i think 8 to 10 years and uh, uh, i think a, a lot of uh, expenses also on the sequencing and while now uh, i think it's going to be like uh, in thousand dollar uh, we can do the human genome sequence uh, for looking for the any uh, health prospect to check for any uh, any of the the errors or the snips change uh, that may correlate with the cancer or any other disease particular disease sir like if we are talking about the genomics and if it is like being uh, used on a, let's say uh, the slide i can see the slide method which we have heard of so let's say if there is a sequence of uh, covid uh, sars covid 19 only different different variants have been coated with the conserved sequences so this won't be a better technique for the diagnosis purpose or we have to uh, let, let's say always go for the sequencing methods only um the chip uh, it is called as chip like uh, yeah. in the the future yeah. it will be like the rapid um test so like earlier there was this um, the kids like the elijah type kids um, they were just doing the home uh, based testing uh, same with the sequencing methods also coming up uh, doing the point of care testing or the genomics testing um there should be like um, because of this even with the are small chip but the surface area these pores are adding such a enormous um, information that if there is a variant missed by the one um, it may be captured by the highly conserved uh, sequence or the tag on the on this chip so that's why sometime in the this micro array type um, where they have the uh, tags for the different types of the pathogens and just to capture the diversity whatever present in the sample it's getting attention also but it's not being used in my lab but um, uh, some labs have uh, advertised this method also also a lot just to capture the the diversity of the pathogens present yeah uh, thank you sir for uh, this oh, session uh, and uh, like was great to attend and Some thanks uh, to the organization who made it uh, available to us uh, sir one thing a general question to ask and after that i'll end my question so like uh, what is the preparations required like and like as you said that it is going to be the uh, next diagnostic uh, era if let's say we are using the chip on methods so let's say what will be the preparation uh, requirements let's say if we are using chip based methods Hmm. For the no, samples, the chip based methods, but um, uh, on our side or the genomic side, like the point of care genomic side in my project, like we are focusing on this microfluidics, uh, where the engineering teams they are uh, making this chip or uh, the disposable cartridge uh, with the microfluidics system that can complete all the library prep steps uh, once the sample will be added um, one more side on the engineering they are using some of this uh, gold plated uh, type uh, um, board or the chips types um, system to to capture the like the prion disease uh, proteins mm -hmm. protein type uh, the prion type of the in infections uh, which is challenging by capturing by any uh, other methods um, yeah on the this chip question is trying, my, just because like uh, when we are talking about the, the covid uh, let's say testing in terms of elisa based methods so we are using vtm viral transfer medium so that is why i asked like what will be the preparatory methods for the sample if we are using the chip based analysis for the sequences I think that this viral transport media is good enough for uh, any virus uh, sample uh, collection or the preservation, I would say. 
Um, and then once you have collected the sample in a proper way, then you can apply on uh, on any method or or for any type of the procedure that you would like to do. Sure, sir. yeah. Thank you for this answer and everything. And uh, sorry for uh, sorry everyone. Like I have took a lot of time. Uh, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Now we, we have, do have a lot of questions. We also have few questions for Bela uh, Desai. Uh, so I'll request Bela also to put her on her camera. In the meanwhile, uh, Doctor, um, uh, you have we have another question for you. Um, so just let me go to that. So there's one question by uh, Dr. Ba ba uh, G.L. Bala Subramani, who asks which NGS technology is best to study germline variants, uh, SNPs, causing uh, cancer risk? Uh, good question. It's like uh, not in my expertise, but I would say uh, these are the basic things people are using. So uh, if you have the information of our your target of interest, um, you can apply the short read method or the long read. Um, some labs prefer now moving towards the long read um, to capture the, the diversity as such, uh, like amplify the product and then um, analysis instead of doing the first in the pieces and then assemble those pieces um, uh, in the short read sequences. But going back to the quality, like the Illumina or the short read sequences, they claim 99.99% accuracy uh, read quality, uh, while this uh, pack bio still have the same accuracy, but this Oxford Nanopore, which is more commonly, commonly used in the long read sequences, is claimed to be less accurate. Um, as compared to the Illumina short read sequencers. So I would say depending on the, uh, you know your interest, if you have that information available, uh, you can decide you wanted to go with the, the targeted method or non-targeted method. And then in the targeted, non-targeted, depending on you wanted to establish this in your lab, and then what is the resources available, or you wanted to collaborate with the, or sending sample to the, uh, any sequencing company, then you can you have more flexibility also to decide on the sequencer side also. So uh, yeah, I don't have the clear right answer, but I would say think about these basic parameters, and that will help you to uh, to make decision on on planning on your experiment. But yeah, feel free to email me if you have any uh, particular question once you make some conclusion, then if you wanted to do further discussion, uh, I will try my best to help you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, are there any more questions for uh, doctor? Please do leave it in the question box and we'll call you. In the meanwhile, we have a question for uh, Dr. Bela Desai. Uh, so there is a Neha Vora had asked if, uh, are there any grants for research on environmental aspects? Yeah, yeah, for um, by environmental aspects, you mean environmental science uh, and ecology. So yes, we do have, you know, so we have a broad biomedical mandate and this does con con cover environmental and ecology aspects as well. Thank you, Bela. I see that most of the questions you have already um, answered in the question box. So if anybody is, uh, wants to ask uh, further questions, you can raise your hand up. Or Bela, if you would like to elaborate, uh, okay, I have, I see Agha has uh, hand up. So I'll unmute. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am, I want to ask that, uh, actually I am a medical doctor. Uh, but I'm more interested in uh, uh, molecular research, like the translational one, uh, and not into like uh, the epidemiological studies and the clinical, which you explained earlier. Uh, so is it possible for someone like me to apply for the basic biomedical research grant or fe uh, fellowship? Yes, you can. 
um so which kind of fellowship whether it is basic or clinical or public health is determined kind of by the kind of project you write so uh, with okay. a post graduate medical degree you would be mm -hmm. eligible to apply under the biomedical stream as well as long as the project is basic biomedical okay so it depends on the project okay. yes yes it depends on the project okay the project and decides with team Hmm. Okay. Um, is it possible uh, to meet you people in person to discuss things in detail? Because uh, here I think uh, time is short. Yeah, I mean, in person meeting in in the time of a pandemic, particularly, is a, is a, <laughs> okay. I, I, uh, maybe maybe like uh, an online meeting then. Yeah. You can definitely write to us at the email IDs I gave at the end of my talk. These email IDs are also present on the website. Uh, website, of course, you can get with a Google search. Uh, whatever email you write to info at indialance.org will be replied to within three working days. Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Also, I, I just would like to add that you, you keep uh, yourself, uh, you know, you can uh, keep looking at our social media handles and our newsletter so that you keep, um, get to know when which um, you know, webinar or which fellowship is being uh, uh, um, you know, advertised. And when the fellowship is being advertised, usually we have webinars explaining everything and answering all the queries. So you can keep yourself uh, informed about that. Uh, through that. Okay, thank you. So, do we have any more questions? We are nearing the, to the end of the program. So if we don't have questions, then you know, we can... Uh, Okay, we, I see the, the Sivshant uh, has his hand up. So I'll just unmute for his question. Just a moment. Okay, I have un un unmuted you, Dr. Sivshant. Uh, sir, I was to ask like, as in like Indian student, we don't have uh, that much of exposure to the international institutes. So, like, is there any, let's say, a, a grant or is there any ongoing projects in your institute in terms of, let's say, bioinformatics or molecular biology where we can write to the PIs and obviously uh, they can, like, let's say, look into that, whether we can offer any exam or anything? So, you mean, uh, getting training or the, the further study in the bioinformatics field or what? So I'm asking in terms of both, like uh, whether we can get uh, industrial training, like, uh, you know, summer training programs kind of, or else like we can join as a full time, let's say, uh, intern or anything. I'm not familiar with this kind of things, but uh, I'm not sure about India, but um, from other countries, um, like let's say our neighboring uh, Pakistan, they have the, the fellowship for the PhD student or the uh, postdocs or the, even the young faculty. Um, they can uh, go uh, visit abroad for the three to six months. And I think they can extend up to one year also. And then um, there are two types of the program and the, I think the similar funding in Egypt also and in Brazil also where the student can get uh, this fellowship and then visit to the lab in abroad to gain experience in the, the area of their interest. And uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if in India we have the similar type of funding or not, but um, this, can, this kind of the funding may be the one option. Uh, regarding the PIs here, I don't think uh, anybody offer this kind of the internship type where to provide the funding from their own side. Um, the funding is very tight and competitive in the US. Um, they prefer to uh, invite someone with the, if they have the funding, already have the funding. Even if like um, the people come with the funding, uh, still it's sometimes hard to get the acceptance because anyone comes to our lab, it's a, it's a big responsibility. 
and uh, we have to devote, devote our time also and especially on the ng side or bioinformatics side it take a lot of time and resources to train any new person um, so uh, i have seen that even they, they prefer to not to accept but having the funding from the home country um, will definitely help to get the uh, acceptance from the abroad uh, Okay. Uh, thank you. You can check on the social media. As, uh, Emma mentioned these are the good tools. Uh, I have seen like on the Twitters also different PIs or the lab they mention if they have any opportunity. Um, I'm sure there will be other sources also, so you can uh, check on those. Uh, keep checking and looking uh, into the area of your interest. Sure, sir. Uh, definitely, we'll look into that as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity to ask the question. Thank you so much. Um, now we are nearing uh, the end. We have a uh, few questions, but mostly most of them are kind of answered in your questions, earlier question. So, uh, Bela, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you'd like to elaborate on any of the questions that you have answered already on the chat box if you feel anything that everybody should know otherwise we can move towards closing um not as such um there were some questions which which i answered but uh, you know as always the office is open uh, to answering questions over email so if something is unclear please do write to us Thank, thank you, Bela. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for answering the questions and clearing everybody's um, you know, doubts. So uh, now we are coming to the end of this session. And uh, I know. I just add here, like. Yeah, sure. Not sure about other sources, but my home university, um, this um, HAU, now the LUAS, uh, Lala Lajpatrai uh, Veterinary University, in their uh, Department of Biotechnology, they also conduct. Uh, training on the bio, uh, this next gen sequencing or the molecular uh, biology. I think every year in the spring, uh, if I'm, I'm clear on that timeline, I think with the pandemic, they may have, last year it was just online, uh, but they may have continued uh, uh, in person training also this year, but you can check. Uh, on that web, uh, their website on the LUAS Department of Biotechnology. Uh, Sometimes I also give lecture, deliver lecture in the in that way. they they have I think three weeks program on the uh, molecular techniques, including the next gen sequencing. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, so with this, I, I would invite uh, uh, you know, Dr. Ratan Chaudhary, uh, the assistant professor uh, in the Department of Bioinformatics, uh, College of Animal Biotechnology, uh, for the vote of thanks on behalf of Gadwasu and the program. Uh, Dr. Ratan, are you uh, able to unmute yourself? Yes, Emma. Thank you. <laughs> please, please go ahead. So um, a very good morning to all. On uh, behalf of Guru Angad Dev Veterinary and Animal Science University and IIT Roorkee, I, Dr. Ratan Chaudhary, <clears throat> Assistant Professor of the College of Animal Biotechnology, Guru Angad Dev Veterinary and Animal Sciences University, Ludhiana, Punjab, feel privileged to propose a vote of thanks for the second lecture of Continue Biotechnology Education or CBE lecture series. I would like to thank uh, the DBT India Alliance for a financial support and organizing this lecture series. In particular, uh, Dr. Vela Desai, Grant Manager of India Alliance and Emma, the coordinator of today's program. I also thank uh, our worthy Vice Chancellor of the Gadwasu, Dr. Inderjit Singh, who has constantly been there to support and guide us. 
I express my cordial and sincere gratitude to our head of the family, the dean, and the coordinator of CBE program, Dr. Yes Paul Singh Malik for all technical help, moral support, and guidance. Thank you, sir. A special thank uh, goes to our eminent researcher and speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Sunil Moore, assistant professor at the Department of Veterinary Population Medicine and Veterinary Diagnostic Lab at the University of Minnesota, USA, for providing an overview of next-gen sequencing. I also thank to all the national and international participants who have shown keen interest in this program and participated in India Alliance CBE lecture series. Once again, thank you all. Stay safe and healthy and, and have a great day. Thank you.